Hi folks, I'm Chris Marshall with Woodworkers Journal Magazine. We woodworkers love to build these classic low Adirondack chairs. But for as easy as they are to build, they're hard to get up and out of because they sit so low to the ground. And that's why these tall outdoor chairs are hugely popular these days. They pick up on some of the same design themes as the low chairs. Slatted seats, a top curve to the back slats, and a contoured seat profile. But obviously, besides their good looks, these chairs are a breeze to get in and out of without squatting or straining, and they're not that much harder to build than the low, classic style Adirondack. You can make them from any three-quarter inch outdoor suitable lumber. I use mahogany for this chair, but cypress, cedar, redwood, or even painted fir would be other good choices. In this video, I'm going to show you how to build one of these chairs, and you can get all the step-by-step -step instructions by visiting woodworkersjournal.com. Those downloadable plans will also show you how to make a pair of tables that connect two of these chairs into a single unit so you can relax with a friend. Now we're going to get started by building the seat section here, and for that, I made this plywood template of the seat rail. It makes duplicating these seat rails quick and easy because I made two of these chairs plus the connecting tables. Now in our plan, we provide a gridded drawing so you can make one of these seat rail templates too. Rip and cross cut a couple of seat rail blanks to rough size and trace the template shape onto them. Then cut out both seat rails at your bandsaw or with a jigsaw. Stay about 1 16th inch outside your layout lines. Once those are cut out, fasten the template to one of the seat rails with strips of double-sided carpet tape. I'm going to use this bearing guided flush trim bit in my router table to trim my seat rails to match the template perfectly. The bearing on top of the bit is going to ride along the edge of the plywood template to shave off the excess material. When you're done template routing one seat rail, repeat the process to do the other one. Now sand your seat rails up to 180 grit and then ease this bottom flat edge with a 1 8 inch roundover bit in a handheld router or at the router table. Next up, rip and cross cut 10 seat slats to size and sand their sharp corners round. I used a drum sander for this job. Then ease their top edges all around with a 1 8 inch roundover bit to add some seating comfort and to help prevent splinters. Once those edges are gone, drill a single screw hole 3 8 inch back from the ends of each slat and centered on its width. Counterboard these holes for number eight screws. They will be filled with wood plugs later to hide the screw heads. Now you can attach the seat slats to the two seat rails. Start with this first one down here in front. Now I've spaced nine of my seat slats apart with these half inch diameter dowels to keep the spacing even. And if you have one, I used a 23 gauge pin nailer to tack all of the slats in place. That way they won't shift around when I'm driving the attachment screws. Use stainless steel or coated exterior screws for all the screws on this chair. I'm using inch and 5 8 long screws here. Be sure to drill pilot holes into the seat rails first before driving in each screw. And for now, only install 9 of the 10 seat slats. We'll leave the last one off until the seat back is in place. Next up comes the legs. They're an inch and a half thick for strength and I made them from two three-quarter inch thick laminations. To speed that process up, I started by face gluing and clamping four and a half inch wide blanks together to form a sandwich for making two legs. You'll need two of these wide glue ups to yield the four chair legs. Be sure to use an exterior rated glue. I'm using Tight Bond 3 in the green bottle here for all the glue joints of this project. Spread the glue evenly and use plenty of clamps to get a good bond. When the glue dries, joint the long edges of the laminations flat and square, then rip them into four two-inch wide legs. Now that we've got the leg blanks ripped to width, it's time to cut them to final length. So let's take another look at the completed chair. Notice that the legs are splaying off of vertical in both directions. It's 11 degrees this way, and 11 degrees this way. And on our material list, we've got these leg blanks listed at 37 inches long, but that's actually the rough length so that you've got some room on the ends for trimming. So at this stage, here's an easy way to avoid mistakes. Miter cut one end of each leg to 11 degrees 
and then measure from this cut end 36 and an eighth inches and make another 11 degree miter cutting line down here. You want these miter angles to face the same direction on both ends of the legs and you want both finished edges of the legs to measure 36 and an eighth inches when you're through. So keeping this in mind, go ahead and miter cut your legs to final length. These top cross braces between the legs are also made from two three-quarter inch pieces. But notice that there's a shorter inner piece between the legs and a longer outer piece that extends all the way to the outside edges of the legs. That's because these cross braces are going to form half lap joints with the legs that look like this. It's going to make these top leg connections much stronger. Rip and cross cut two inner and two outer top cross braces to size, then miter cut their ends to 11 degrees. Now I'll go ahead and glue up the top cross braces to make a pair of doubled up laminations like this. Arrange the parts so the shorter cross brace is centered on the length of the longer cross brace. That'll give you half of the half lap joint I was talking about earlier. Now set the cross braces in place on the legs and use them to trace where to cut the legs for the other half of the half lap joints. Then swivel your miter gauge to 79 degrees and use a wide dado blade to cut them. A clamped stop block helped me register the ends of these cuts accurately. And over here at the drum sander, I'm knocking off the sharp bottom corners of the legs so they're less likely to splinter when the chair gets dragged around. Now go ahead and glue and clamp a top cross brace between each pair of legs. When the glue dries, drive a couple of counterboard inch and a quarter screws through these joints to strengthen them. You can help hide them by placing the screws on the inside faces of the leg assemblies. And now you can fill these screw counterboards with wood plugs, then give your leg sets a thorough sanding up to 180 grit and ease their long edges with a 1 8 inch roundover bit. And with the leg sets done, now we're going to go ahead and make this lower footrest assembly. It consists of these two lower cross braces, a back stretcher, and this curved footrest piece. Make up these lower cross braces and this back stretcher just like you did the legs from two 3 quarter inch thick glued up laminations. And then cut your lower cross braces to 27 and 3 quarters inches long and miter cut the ends to 11 degrees and have the direction of these miters facing the same way. Now this back stretcher is 18 and a half inches long and just cut the ends of it square. Now if there's any aspect to this chair project that's tricky, in my experience, here it is. These lower cross braces require two half lap cuts so they can wrap around the legs here and here. And I've marked up one of these parts. Now the back half lap joint is on the back of the part. And the front half lap cut is three and a quarter inches back from the top angled end of the piece. Now notice that this front half lap joint is facing the opposite direction from the back half lap joint. And the front one is also facing the opposite direction from the angled front miter on this part. These cuts may look easy, and they are, but pay super close attention when you're marking the parts and setting up your miter gauge angles so you'll cut these joints facing the correct direction. It's surprisingly easy to get confused when you're cutting opposite facing angles once your layout marks are face down, and don't ask me how I know this. Here's how they should look when you're done. And to help me draw the curve on the front of my footrest here, I've got an inexpensive thin metal straight edge held in place inside of a long clamp. And by changing the clamping pressure, I can change the amount the straight edge bows, and that'll give me a different curve. So once you've got the curve drawn on the front of your footrest, cut it out with your jigsaw or bandsaw and sand it smooth. Give the cross braces and stretcher a good sanding too and ease the edges of the footrest to make it less likely to splinter. Then follow the drawings in the downloadable plan to assemble the footrest framework with long counterboard exterior screws. And now we can go ahead and put these big components together and here's where they go. Measuring from the inside edges of the legs, 
the bottom of the footrest assembly goes eight inches up from the bottoms of the legs. And the bottom of the seat assembly goes 25 inches up from the bottoms of the legs. So go ahead and mark those locations out. Clamp the seat and footrest assemblies into place between the legs and mark the bolt hole locations. Center a single bolt on each of the joints. Then drill 5 16 inch diameter holes all the way through at your marks and install the bolt hardware. I'm using stainless steel carriage bolts, flat washers, and nylon insert lock nuts to secure these joints because the metal won't rust. And three inch long carriage bolts will give you just the right amount of length. And now that the chair base is assembled, we can go ahead and add the back to it. The back consists of these seven tapered back slats, but they all start off at the same proportions, 26 inches long and two and three quarters inches wide. And then once the tapering work is done, they attach to these two curved upper and lower back supports. When you've got the seven back slat blanks cut to size, set up a tapering jig so you can reduce them to two and one eighth inches at the bottom. This jig from Rockler holds each slat at an angle, and it has a bar that rides in my table saw's miter slot to make the angled cuts. But whatever tapering jig you use, rip the tapers along both edges of all seven slats, resetting your jig as needed between cuts. Next, we can cut our tapered back slats into this gentle 21 inch radius curve. Now I've got my back slats clamped together with the edges aligned, and to draw that curve, you're gonna need a trammel, which looks something like this. It's basically just an oversized compass with an adjustable metal point on one end and a fixture for holding a pencil in the other end. Now I've got my trammel set up for 21 inches between the two points. Position the trammel in the middle of the center slat and so the pencil point is even with the slat's top edge. Draw the radius across all the slats. Now notice down here on the bottom ends of the back slats that when they're clamped together this way, they form just a little bit of a curve. We're gonna draw a straight line across all the slats that's even with the middle slat. And then we're gonna trim all of these slats flat across the bottom. It'll make the slats easier to install on the bottom back support later. Cut the slats along your layout lines with a bandsaw or jigsaw. Then round over the sharp top corners and sand them smooth. Ease their long edges and ends to minimize splinters. And that brings us to these upper and lower back supports and we'll make those next. Each of them has this two inch wide curve section plus straight portions on the ends that attach to the chair frame. And here's how to lay out their curves. I've made up blanks for my upper and lower back supports and I've drawn a reference line across the middle of each. Now I've got my upper back support carpet taped to this long piece of scrap MDF and it's got a line drawn down the middle of it and here's why I did that. The line allows me to square up my workpiece to the MDF and it also gives me a reference line for aligning the point of my trammel. I've also drawn a reference mark two inches in from the front edge of the upper back support and an inch and three quarters in from the front edge of the lower back support. These two marks will set the inside curve of these parts. With your trammel set to a 26 inch radius, draw the inside curve on the upper back support so it touches the mark you drew. Then shift the trammel forward and draw the outside curve so it aligns with the back edge of the upper back support. For both of these curves, keep the trammel's metal point on the center line of the backer board. Then repeat the process for the lower back support, only this time switch the trammel to a 24 inch radius instead. And now with the curved lines drawn, we need to add the flat portions onto the ends. So make a mark two inches back from the front edge of the lower back support and two and a quarter inches back from the front edge of the upper back support. Then draw short perpendicular lines over to the back curve on both of these parts like this. Now notice that the flat portion on the upper back support is about three times longer than the flat portion on the lower back support. Now grab just the upper back support and head to the table saw. We need to bevel rip its front edge to 11 degrees. When you set the rip fence for this cut, make sure the blade will trim right across the top corner but not make the part any narrower in the process. Rip the front edge to this angle. 
And now at your bandsaw, go ahead and cut just the back profile of the upper and lower back supports. I make the straight cuts first against the fence, then cut along my back curved layout lines to remove the waist pieces. Do this for both back supports. Now the last cuts we need to make on these back supports, this inside curve, is what gives the back of the chair its tilt. So we're going to make these last curve cuts at 7 degrees off of vertical. So tilt and lock your bandsaw's table at 7 degrees. I'm using a bevel gauge here to dial in my settings. And then go ahead and cut along those curved inside layout lines. Now it feels a little weird at first cutting with the bandsaw's table at an angle, but it's really not that hard. Just cut a little bit to the waist side of your layout lines and go slowly. Now sand these curved edges smooth and remember, if you're using a spindle sander like I am here, be sure to tilt your sander's table to 7 degrees so you can maintain that inside curved tilted edge. Then once the curves are smooth, round over these outside edges. And now you can go ahead and attach the back slats to the lower back support. I'm going to use the upper back support to help hold the slats, but not to attach to them yet. That comes later. Start with the middle slat, lining it up with the middle of the curve. Attach it with a single counterboard number 8 by 2 inch screw. Then space the slats 5 16 of an inch apart. I'm using a dowel to do that here. Attach each slat to the lower back support with a single screw, then plug the screw holes and trim them flush. Now the armrests are the last parts we need to make before putting the rest of this chair together and we'll make them exactly the same way as we made the seat rails. I started with a plywood template that I made from the gridded drawing in our downloadable plans and then I used that to trace my armrests, cut them out, and template route them to final shape. Easy stuff. And now we can fit the seat back into place and make some final modifications. Here I've got the lower back support clamped to the seat rails and I've got the two armrests clamped to the upper back support. Set the armrest assembly on the top cross braces of the legs and so its front beveled edges are flush against the back ends of the cross braces. Shift it left to right to overhang the cross braces evenly and clamp it in place. Then move each arm left to right until their flat inner edges overlap the inside faces of the legs by about a half an inch. So now that the armrests are in the right position, you should have a little bit of an overlap here where the armrest crosses the upper back support. So go ahead and trace the armrest profile onto the upper back support and trim off this waist at your bandsaw. Then round over the top edges of the arms to help prevent splinters. I used a quarter inch round over bit to do that. And once those sharp edges are gone, go ahead and attach the armrests to the upper back support with single two inch carriage bolts. Just center these bolts where the parts overlap. Then reclamp the armrests on the chair and drive three two inch counterboard screws through each to attach them to the top cross braces. When that's done, drive one three inch counterboard screw through the back legs and into the ends of the lower back supports too to anchor the seat back assembly here. Now you can install the rearmost seat slat that you set aside way back at the beginning of this build. Then fan out the back slats and attach them to the upper back support with a single counterboard 2 inch wood screw. I'm using 3 8 inch dowels to space them apart here. And finally, there's a bunch of wood plugs to install to hide all the screw heads on this chair. So take care of that work now. So that wraps up the construction process on this tall chair. And I'm going to finish this one just like I did these two with a semi-transparent oil-based deck stain and that's it. This is a fun project to build and it'll be a welcomed addition to any deck, poolside, or patio whether you build one chair, two chairs, or two chairs plus these connecting tables and you can learn how to build those in our downloadable plan. So I hope you enjoyed building this project and thanks for watching.